Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Marjorie Burns, a woman who's truly defying aging. She's an author, retired Portland State University literature professor, lover of words, and dogs. She enjoys riding her bike and cross-country skiing in the Cascade Mountains where she now lives, and she just released a book called The New Cadets. She started this book when she was in her 60s and completed it in her 80s. In this episode, I'm talking all about her inspiration for her book, why she believes in living in the country and how it keeps her young, her connection to J.R.R. Tolkien, what it is like for her to grow up in Portland in the 40s, and what she's learned about getting older. Marjorie has a beautiful outlook on life and a great story about learning new things after 40. Let's introduce you to Marjorie Burns. Hey, Health Junkies, I have Marjorie Burns on, and today we're going to be talking about lots of things, in, in fact, and we'll get to her book. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But first and foremost, we, we want to talk about what it's like to keep up on your health and moving into our 80s, of course. So Marjorie, welcome to the Health Fix podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, one of the the notes that I had on our, our podcast notes is that no one is born wanting to be an 80 year old woman. You know, no one's born thinking about what it's going to be like when we get older, because we're only in the moment, especially as kiddos, we're thinking about what it's going to be like as kids. So tell us, tell us this. You grew up in you were born in Portland, correct? Right. In the 40s. So you've seen a lot of change in Portland. Because I think a lot of people see Portland now and and they think about breweries, they think about, you know, food and and what it's there with that. Tell us a little bit what it was like to grow up in Portland in the 40s. Oh, well, restaurants were of such interest. And my family did not go out to uh, to eat very, very rarely. Maybe if we were on vacation and going to the beach, Hannah Beach, you might know it yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, we go to a restaurant. But uh, nobody thought much about that. It was a different world. Uh, you went to school. Girls could not wear pants to school. And uh, there you were. You, you, people were more obedient. Children today, so I hear, are more outspoken and, and less uh, likely to behave. I don't think that would be true where I live in Trout Lake. <laughs> Things are quite different. You see children going around in the back of pickup trucks in the, in the summer and jumping off bridges into water and bicycling in all sorts of places. So I would say that Trout Lake is still in the 50s or 60s. Mm. That's and they're healthy, competent kids. They get a lot of scholarships around the country. It's quite a school. Ah, I did not know that about Trout Lake. I did not know that. But I like that the kids are riding in the back of the trucks and jumping off bridges and playing, you know, and, and yep. not, you know, not having the phone connected in front of them. That's I like to see that. Adults, too. I think I like to adults see that. Too. Adults, too. Well, I don't know if I fully answered your first question. Portland, uh, it was a uh place where you trusted your policeman and nowadays their suspicion. Maybe people still trust their policemen, some people in Portland, not all of them because we've had our riots and, and, and such there. But it, when I was growing up, uh, we really were free during the day. I mean, we'd check in at home, but I'd go to the neighbors. One house down, they had a huge block. We lived on a double size block as it was, but they had a great chunk of that and the other houses had only small backyards. They had huge cherry tree, huge beech tree that was taller than their three-story house. And you'd climb it all the time, just go up to it and be there. And then dinner would come, you'd go home and then you could go out in the summer and play. And and it isn't so today, I understand. You, you want to be there when your children are off, but we were fairly free, even I as a girl, though I resented my brother had a little more freedom going off on his bicycle. No one explained to me why it was harder for girls. I kind of wish they would have, but that wasn't some topic that they could bring up easily. <laughs> sure. But it was a, it was a free and a, and a happy, basically, not without its sorrows, as every life has. 
Sure. But it was a good, good upbringing and a lot of freedom. My mother said once that freedom and fairness were the words that defined me. I didn't like things that were unfair to not just to myself, but to, to others and, and, uh, and being, being free. Ah, freedom and fairness. Interest, interesting word choices and, and, and thinking I, about, yeah. Huh. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, the, the fairness. Did you, how many brothers and sisters did you have? One brother, five. And mind you, I feel obliged to say five and a half because when I was a child, that half was essential. And a sister who was three and a half years older. Um, my brother disappeared about 47 years ago in Thailand. He'd been living there and knew the language and had started a nature conservancy. Uh, he was a medical doctor, as was my father and, um, and one of my sons. And uh, he took a trek through the jungles in Malaysia and never came back. Mm -hmm. My youngest son was conceived about the time he disappeared, which is gives one a little magical feeling, you know? Yeah. So he's gone. He was about 40 at that time. And now my sister lives in Berkeley and um, she was the one that taught herself to read. She was the really bright one. Uh, they took her off at school for other tests, but my brother and I did fine. We've all written, we've all published. My, the book that I have coming out now is not my first book, but it, but it is my first book of fiction. Let's go into your book because it's it's written for middle grade readers. So middle middle school readers is what I'm gathering. Yeah. Yes and no. Oh, it's okay. Also, it's also on up for adults. And I look at my PhD is in um, 19th century British literature where you get a lot of writers who wrote People maybe don't know the name now, George MacDonald. And, and the, the writing is, is definitely for children, but for adults too. As you would say, The Hobbit is, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Harry Potter is, and um, The Golden Compass, books like that. It's not intended only for children, uh -huh. but that's where you would start. And I have a friend who's wonderful, wonderful little 10-year-old nutty grandson read it and said it's the best book I've ever read <laughs> and he could get all the words I use the occasional big word if it fits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow and and in the book you know I I kind of took a, a quick look at things and I was seeing how you know we're, we're kind of using imagination we're using you know kind of bringing the child out in us. And so I can see how having a book like this would be great for adults to kind of tune in to their child within them. So tell us a little bit about the book in terms of the new cadets and where, where, what was speaking to you in terms of writing it? What, what, what came across? What were you thinking about in, in creating it? Well, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, thinking about my uh, oldest grandchild, I was in my 60s when I started, so this magical, she wrote this book at 80 isn't really quite true because I would <laughs> write it, summers go on, and I'm kind of a fussy writer, do a lot of rewriting. Sebastian was five or six years old, and he started having night terrors, those extreme nightmares, which apparently can even come back and haunt you in the day. And I bought him an almost full-size stuffed toy um, yellow lab and said that this this dog had been trained to work in dreams. It was a service dog. He named it Oliver after a, a, um, a Boston Terrier dog they'd had that died. So Oliver came into being and I then began to write him little newsletters, some snooze news about these dogs. And then that didn't got, get incorporated into the book, but uh, that set things going. I started writing about these dogs, starting with Oliver who's recruited off a shelf in a toy <laughs> store, taken off to the academy where they're trained. And um, this is a spoiler, no, they, the dogs in going to this partially magical place take on flesh. I wish I had a better word to put it. They become alive, but it's more than that. They become real dogs. Mind you, it's not a Pinocchio story. They're not wanting to be a real boy, a real dog. They They very much like being... A personal toy and when they go back they are personal toys trained then to work with children but when they go to the place where they 
learn things uh, and learn about how to handle dreams, they are able to run around. They are full dogs, but they can talk and and do all of those things. Um, it's a world that has magic in it, but I purposely did not want it to be wand waving, spell casting, easy things. There are, it's it's more like the world we have with some things you wouldn't expect. In a sense, there's a a sea called the variable sea. It switches every 12 hours and 25 minutes. Might be a pond. Usually it's a sea or a lake. And, and you have to be on the shore when that happens or most of the time. So you have to deal with it, but you can't compel it. People can't stand on a bluff and wave a wand and make it do this or that. Um, and there are other places that they, they go. There's a valley below where the academy is that has moods in it. And these same moods appear in dreams and influence dreams. Um, now and then you'll get a mood storm emerging from the valley and the people will find themselves inexplicably angry or maudlin and you know, loving, feeling how much I've always loved my friends or, or ridiculous or sad. Um, and they're overwhelmed by these moods. Hmm. So it's that kind of magic. It's magic they're living with and having to accommodate to the dogs and the people there. Hmm. Fun to write about. One of the greatest fun moments was writing them taking on flesh. You know, when they all of a sudden find their breathing. Yeah. Their head, have to learn to walk. They have to learn to eat. Some of the older dogs teach them the mysteries of the toilet. Because these, so that was fun to write too, and delicately enough, it's not crude, but it was great fun to write about those things. Hmm. You know, I think about this, and I'm going, okay, you were writing this in your 60s, and and I think a lot of us have have somewhat lost our our magical thinking, let's put it that way, or our imagination in terms oh. of being able to use it. I don't think we've lost it in terms of it being there, but I think we've we've lost the art of being able to use that. Do you feel like in working with, in literature and and being a, a professor, do you, did you find that one of your, your special tricks was to kind of help students really bring this out for themselves? I never had that intention, but I maybe <laughs> did, if you know what I mean. I'm not saying I'm going to see that these people get back to their <laughs> days of imagining. I've found since I wrote this book that all of a sudden I'm an expert on aging. And I think, oh, wait a minute, I just went <laughs> on. You know, I didn't do anything. I don't have a fitness program. Mm -hmm. I'm just living in the country. It's easy. Um, you, you, it stays with you. And I've always, always sort of imagined things. Or like a friend of mine says, they have their toaster has a name, and they talk to their toaster. I do that sort of thing in some ways too. I just feel the world is alive in in lots of ways, and. There's the imagination. We don't lose it. Well, I want to say, since I've been asked to be an expert on aging, mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't born an octogenarian. octogenarian uh, and, and life isn't like a bus where you go along and you get let off at a stop and stay there a while. And then your childhood, adolescence, another bus stop, early adulthood, another bus stop. It's more like a train where everything you were is pulling along with you. Mm -hmm. I have such strong memories of childhood, of climbing the beech tree <laughs> um, and doing all those things. It's it's so much with me. And people tend to think, ooh, you become old. You are an old person. There you are. That's it. Yeah. Not true. You are and you aren't. You're all of the things, all of the things in my experience. Well, I think, you know, in in my, you know, I'm 46 years old at the moment, but talking to my father, who's 88, he says, I look at myself in the mirror and my 20 year old self is is trying to figure out who the heck's looking back at me because I think of all of these different adventures. I think of all these different things. So it's fascinating for me to hear kind of what people think about you know, and, and how society kind of portrays certain things, but yet we're, we're not talking as much about the thoughts that we have, the feelings that we have, the, you know, 
not so much, you know, memories, but also what we're thinking about going forward, things we want to do, things we want to, you know, adventure with. Let's put it that way. Absolutely. I remember my mother saying in her 80s, she'd wake up some mornings and feel just great. And she'd pass the mirror and go, my heavens, I'm an old woman. Uh, this is what your dad is saying, too. You don't you don't lose that other person. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that for a lot of folks, you know, let's when I was in my 20s, I thought my age now was older, you sure. know. And so you think to yourself, what's it going to be like when I get older? What's going to happen? And, you know, I would agree that even myself, I look in the mirror and I still think I'm like 18, to, you know, 22, sure. just like my dad. How can we help people to to realize that using that child within us can keep us young, can keep us playful? What are some of the different techniques that you've used with kind of the thoughts you have going through your mind of, of maybe the tree, maybe different things? What does it lead you to kind of think about doing when you're out in the country? Let's put it that way, since you're living in the country. I'm not sure that I think about it much. As I said, I don't have a fitness routine. I was asked that and I got thinking, well, when I brush my teeth, not every time, but um a lot of the time I stand on one leg or the other. That's maybe my routine or I'll drop down now and then and do a downward dog. Um, <laughs> but mostly we're in, when you're in the country, you're doing things. Yeah. I have dogs. Dogs. I just read that Jane Goodall said, yes, she worked with chimpanzees, but dogs are her favorite animal. <laughs> and she can't imagine a world without dogs. If I'm going to give advice and you're in a situation where you can do it, get a dog because I'm here typing to my computer and the one or two dog will come and bop my hand up. Time to go out. And so we're out and we bicycle. Well, they don't bicycle, but I do. And they run along or we ski. I'm on skis. They're on foot. Um, and around here, I'm just, I've gone lazy in my old age. I just go out the door to ski. I don't bother driving somewhere, but it's cross country skiing. I twice lived in Norway and, and that's what they, that's how you get around. You know, if you're not in the city and riding buses and things, you, uh, you're out in the country at all. You put on skis, you go pushy, which means walk on skis. <laughs> and uh, there's that. And around here, there are caves, as you, you know, the, the lava tube caves. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't yep. know if they've got them around Tacoma, but you certainly are near to where they are. And they're fun to explore. Um, they're swimming. It's pretty cold most of the time. You have to get midsummer really before I enjoy it much anymore. But there's all sorts of things to do, and you have to work. The land makes you work. If I lived in the city, which I've done, what would I do? I think I'd find a place to swim, and I think I'd do yoga. But I'm not much one for gyms other than climbing gyms. I rock climb. I love rock climbing. Really? The sports I've most loved are whitewater kayaking and rock climbing. And whitewater kayaking, I started in my 40s and rock climbing in my 50s. Wow. Wow. It's and wonderful. Oh my goodness. Being a rock climber, I've only, well, that's not entirely true. I, I did a couple outdoor rock climbs, but I like the gym. It seemed a little safer. Have you have you been going on rock climbing adventures? Have you done anything outdoors or mostly staying in the rock climbing gym? I've done it in Joshua Tree. Um, and I've done it north of Leavenworth. There's some areas. Um, I've done it in Bishop, California, <laughs> where yeah. we um, a good friend of mine who was a graduate student of mine, and she's like a daughter, uh, someone set us up to do a really high climb, really kind of terrifying. He says, oh, you'll love this. And we were kind of, ah, it was way, way up. I've forgotten how many hundreds of feet, but so high up that I'm shouting down to Elizabeth, take, which means you want to rest. They hold you and you can sit in the harness for a while and kind of get yourself back together. And I'm going, take, and she's going, what? She couldn't <laughs> hear me. <laughs> oh. Then she figured if she's calling down, she probably wants me to give her a rest. And we did. So, yes, I've been outside, mostly gym, because in the days I was climbing most, uh, I was in Portland. So I go to a, a place. I have a 27 foot climbing wall in this house from the middle floor to the roof. Whoa, that's really cool. 
Oh my goodness. Now, now do you climb with your grandchildren? Do they come? Does your son come? Do you, does the family climb too? They do. My, I started it and they got into it. And my youngest son was on the, the U S climbing team and went to Russia when he was 19. Oh, wow. uh, so he climbs a lot and he has his, his nine-year-old son uh, climbing. He's a very good climber. Just one child there. Wow. I had four kids and I only have two grandchildren, one going at 24 and one nine. Um, but that's okay. So they're all good climbers. My daughter is, my oldest son, who is more of the kayaker. He was on the U.S. kayaking team when he was a young man. And he just, let me brag. Yeah. Brag. He got 63 because I was 20 when he was born. He just won a regional slalom race against uh, contestants of all ages. He was the number one number one person. And he doesn't tell me these things. He, he just mentioned he'd been off. He lives next door to me now, he and his wife. He mentioned he had been off at a slalom race. And I said, well, did you win? And he said, yes. And I said, in your age group? And he said, well, there, no, it was, uh, it was anybody, people in their <laughs> 20s on up. And he was the number one. Wow. But none of us have been team sport people. We've always, for me, I like exploring. I like, you know, in the woods where there are these entrances to lava tubes, I go off the roads uh, because then you find really interesting things. Usually the dogs are with me. And and I realize I like bicycling. Um, I, I like uh, kayaking. Rock climbing is probably the only thing that's not an exploration sport that I really love. What What's your favorite river to explore? Uh, the Rogue River in Southern Oregon. I haven't <laughs> tested whether I can still roll up when you flop over. I haven't done that for a couple of three years. We'll, we'll have to see. I'll make myself do it this summer so I can report back to you. Yes, you'll you'll have to. I, I that's one thing I did not master very well. I could do it great in the pool, but if we got out somewhere, I just was not very good at it. I don't know if the running water freaked me out or what. It, I, it, I get it. I know the first time I went over in in a rapid. We always tell yourself, okay, line your paddle up. You know how you do. Uh, don't bring your head up last of all. The body sweep the paddle. I just went whap. I didn't give it a thought. I just came up because it was approaching a, a, a waterfall and not a death one, but I didn't want to be upside down going through that. I was on the um, Deschutes River, I think, that in Oregon where that happened. But I just, I don't know if I panicked, but I did it. I got up. I No memory, just doing it. But I know what you mean. It's hard in white water. It is. It is. That's a, I mean, kayaking, my husband loves to kayak. I, I prefer the paddle boarding so I can stay, I can bail easily. That's probably why. Got you. Exactly. I've never <laughs> tried paddle boarding. I have done once in Norway, some sail, um, what do we call it? A sail brett in Norwegian means uh, like a tray, sailing tray. What a, Sailboard, isn't that what we call it? Maybe, maybe that I'm, losing, I'm losing my English. No, well, I'm trying to figure. Well, do you think it's windsurfing? Like windsurfing. Wind Thank you. I knew I was wrong. <laughs> well, it makes sense for a sailboard. I mean, it's like the board and 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 the 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 big. Yeah, that, that's the did, did you ever go out to Hood River with the with the windsurfing and or see? No, the I only did it. Norway, though I'm very close to the river, I'm only 20 miles away. That's that's the big city if you live where I live. <laughs> when people at Trout Lake say they're going to town, they don't mean going to Trout Lake. They mean <laughs> going to the river. Yeah, yeah. Hood River is uh, an impressive place. Have you have you thought about maybe trying to do some some kayaking on on the river down there, or do you do you do you still kayak right now? I do, I'm not, nothing as much, uh, but I mostly do flat water to what? Class one, maybe class two. I'm not doing class four, definitely never did class five that I know of. Um, though there were a couple of rivers in Norway that were pretty wild. Whew. Any rate, I, you know, it's like not doing downhill skiing. And it's not only my age, but 
I don't like to pay for things. And I've lived in Norway where the cross country skiing was the main bit and where, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just right there. It's handy. You don't have to travel. Yeah. Yeah. I like the, I like where I live in Wisconsin. When we have, I like to go out the back door and just go through the farm country. And like you said, explore. Exactly. Exactly. And the days when there's an, just enough of a crust, the dogs can run along without wallowing because sometimes it's no good for dogs. And, and the whole world is just smooth. You can just like almost skate any direction. You don't need two tracks that you've made to go back to. And when the snow is really high, the fences are gone. The world isn't divided anymore. <laughs> I love that. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. All, yep. All one world. Nobody's sort of chopping it up and owning it. <laughs> it's coming back to your freedom that your mom was talking about. With <laughs> Coming back to the freedom my mother talked about. Right. I can only speak from my life experience. I don't have a certification in, 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 in the material you've got. But that's beside the point. Advice, if you can, keep doing the things you enjoy. Bicycling, and I'm afraid to say that because if you get on in Christ, you could sue me. But um, no. no, it does come back. And it, it feels so good. One of my friends says, uh, he's slightly younger than I am, a retired judge. He says that when he's on a bicycle, he feels like a 10-year-old child. It's exactly right. You don't feel 83 like I am or whatever age I'd been when I was biking. Again, you just, you feel, you move so quickly and so freely. Yeah. And you're kind of flying. <laughs> it's such a good feeling. I think I wouldn't even worry about advice, Marjorie. I'd be thinking like you're, you're saying right now, the feeling. And I think for a lot of people hearing that there's still that, childlike feeling we get when we get on a bike or even just watching you light up talking about cross-country skiing and you know when the snow's deep enough yes the world is is wide open then we don't have borders we have the freedom to go and I think for a lot of people if we look into thoughts that we might have on getting older and 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 why some people give up their different you know, hobbies, or they switch to something different. It sounds like adaptation, adapting is is what happens over time. You you stay with the things that you feel good with, and other things you kind of just adapt. Precisely, I I think this whole publishing a book and being asked about being my age has made me have to think about it. Uh, <laughs> friends who moved from Trout Lake, a couple, to a retirement community near Salem, Oregon. And I think about retirement communities. I, I know people have gone there and then that's sort of it. Maybe they do an exercise class and, and it sounds wonderful not to have to do the cooking. Though my, I have, my second son lives with me and, and yeah, we about split it half and half, but still how nice to have a meal there some community place, not to have to always every day, what do we do tonight? What do we, you know, what do we have that we can cook? Um, they did it well, my friends. He taught high school choir for eons and um, did it here in our Trout Lake community. He now has a choir in the community and they, he and his wife, she's an excellent pianist. She um, is singing in the choir too. So they made the best of it. They. They were wearing out, keeping track. They're maybe a year older than I am, but doing their, um, the property was wearing them out. And now they're free to keep doing the things they like doing. So it, I, nothing is a simple answer. Avoid retirement homes. That's not the answer. Go to retirement home. that Because you're taking yourself with you yeah. wherever you go, as they say. <laughs> I have my uh, second son is uh, living here and he's doing a lot of taking over of the property and doing all sorts of things I never had done before. Made more trails down to our river and and uh, it's very nice. Pass some of it on, but I try to pitch in too. I don't want to leave it all with him. <laughs> What's your favorite chore outside where you pitch in? What do you like to do? Oh my, well, I like gardening often is the chore I'm in the middle of. <laughs> we, were, we took down three pine trees that were dead and um, 
cut into rounds and now we still have some that we haven't split and used a splitter. That was great fun. It was working, all of us working hard, taking the split pieces of wood and heaving them over. And I thought, I can still do this. I feel great at the end of the day. It doesn't bother me. Or I would run the machine uh, that would go back and forth and split the rounds. Um, yeah, I think I like that best when you're kind of using your muscles and, <laughs> and getting something done. See, if you go to a gym, you're doing, you know, if I find them dull, I would go to one if that's all there were. I have nothing against them, but my joy comes from getting things done at the same time and not thinking, by golly, here I am exercising. You're just living. <laughs> I think my dad would agree with you on that one. Just having the satisfaction, you know, even he still chops his own wood, having the, the wood pile and being like, I have that. You go to the gym, there's no wood pile that comes out of that. It's still waiting there for you is what he tells me. He he makes fun of me for going to the gym. No, you shouldn't shouldn't feel that way. It's fine. It just uh, it's the way I have nothing against team sports and my husband who represented the naturopathic college, he um played tennis for I think tennis is great, but it doesn't really interest me. I used to tease him and say it's coloring coloring within the lines. You have to get the ball, you know, within the, I yeah. like escaping. I like going over walls and climbing walls uh, more, more than, than that. But he was quite good at tennis. <laughs> I I get the theme here. You, you like to, you like to adventure. You like to live, you know, one day at a time with these adventures. And, and, you know, if we bring it back to, to your book and we're looking at your, your being a teacher, you know, I was, I keep saying teacher, I, a professor, I apologize. That's right. You teach when you're a professor. <laughs> and, and, and looking at, you had your dissertation on children's literature in, right. in the 19th century in England. And so I'm going, okay, you, you have had, you know, from, from history, I'm seeing like this, this fascination with, with literature child you know and and it brings it full circle in terms of you're still exploring your When you when you were working on your dissertation, what kind of works of of literature? What kind of works were you were you drawn to? I, well, I like big fat novels. <laughs> uh, I thought I might have done a lot of work in Dickens, but didn't. Where I taught at Portland State, there was a a man from Yugoslavia whose education was Oxford, and he kind of owned Dickens. It's only when he went on sabbatical I got to teach Dickens. Uh, this is maybe not. Worth saying, my great grandmother went to church with Dickens. Interesting. Doesn't give me any special insight, but and nobody bothered to tell me that till I was well into my degree. Oh, by the way, your great grandmother went to church with Dickens. Um, I like big fat novels. I like George Eliot, if you know her books, Middlemarch and such. And and I also liked children's literature, and so. And those books can be very long, the Victorian books for, for children and adults. Uh, and, and it seemed a natural, a natural place to go. Um, of course, when you get a PhD in English, you, you're doing everything from old English, uh, 18th century, Shakespeare, the whole works. And so it's, it's not just uh, one item. My final chapter, look forward to C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien, they were both born Victorians, but they did their writing in the 20th century. And 
because of that, I got sort of tapped on the shoulder by someone who wanted me to join a group working with Tolkien. So I get together one mo- once a month on Zoom. Um, and so I have, I have a book with the University of Toronto Press on Celtic and Norse mythology with Tolkien. Um, and so I've got a lot of Tolkien in my, in my uh, pocket as well. I met his son, who's now deceased, and who sent me some things that hadn't been published. And uh, it's like a family, this group that now is meeting by Zoom. Uh, we've been together 25, 27 years or something meeting. But that's a side part. So with Tolkien there, that probably, that came after I wrote my dissertation, but it all bound together. It all fit together. Wow. Wow. You know, I think about reading. I think about literature. You've got your crew. You know, we're thinking about some of the things that keep us going, right? And and give us our purpose for life. You've got your group on on Zoom. You've got your fascination with the literature, but also your your athletics too. Now, what do you think of, of writing this day and age, modern literature? Is it do you enjoy certain folks now or are you kind of gravitating still back towards the 19th and, and 20th centuries? I think probably back that way, um, influenced a lot by Wind in the Willows and, and even a uh, wonderful piece, a book that greatly influenced Tolkien too. Uh, of the modern writers, I greatly admire the Harry Potter book, Harry Potter books, but they're not, quite my kind of thing, um, but they're so to be admired. She did so much to make kids read. Now there is wand waving and spell casting and great fun it is. Uh, also, uh, Philip Pullman's The Golden Compass. They made a wonderful movie of it, only one movie. Uh, I think it was offensive to conservative Christians. I never saw the conflict. I never saw the worry. I just I thought it beautifully written. So that's modern. Mm-hmm. And so I, do appreciate that as well, but much comes from what I read in the 19th century, sort of a simpler time. People have their ideas, like they have the idea what an old person is, and it's uh, not always quite true. Your last statement is really good in terms of kind of bringing everything together, is that we have our ideas of what getting older is like. We have an idea of what, and a quote, and, and I say quote old person because I and the older I get, the younger everybody else older than me gets. And I don't know if you had this experience as well in your life. Absolutely. Perfect. You said it just perfectly. Years later, I learned Norwegian in my 40s and Dutch after that. So don't let people tell you you can't learn language. You, you learn it differently, but you learn it. If you've ever learned a foreign language, one of the things you've learned is how to learn a foreign language. Mm-hmm. If you okay. see what I mean, your brain is receptive to other ways of looking at things. So, but the love of words is so much with me. Hmm. And I that can... from my childhood. <laughs> I can see that. I can see that. So what brought you to Norway? I am curious. I went the first time uh, with the husband on sabbatical. And I went the second time on a Fulbright, where one of the Fulbrights where you're, you go as a professor and you teach. And I learned Norwegian and uh, taught in English, but I, I could certainly get around in Norwegian. <laughs> no means uh, I am not bilingual in either French or Norwegian, but competent. I can do what I need to do. It's it's interesting you say the love of words. I I love the words and and connection with with that the words mean. You know that you bring with someone and being able to communicate in a different language as well. It seems that your your words are so much more meaningful now, now when you have different words you can use, right? The more words, the more the more you can communicate. Did you find that as, as you were learning more languages and, and starting to learn more about Dutch and bringing that on too? Did it have you feeling exhilarated that you have more words now to use? Right, and you, in if you're working in another language, even not very well, you, least my experience, and I've had someone else tell me the same thing, you feel like you're living another life. You're another person, sort of, not 
you haven't dumped your previous person, but it's it's as though you've expanded. So you're living as a bigger, broader, slightly different individual for that the time you're in that language, you're understanding it. And the first time you understand a joke in a foreign language, it's hilarious because you understood it. It may not be a very a very good joke, particularly. And and reading, when you first read, I had a, a, a friend in Norway who said when she was in English, she was reading ladies' romances. She said, I'd never touch one in Norwegian, but I could understand them, and so they felt good. I was reading Agatha Christie. I've done that in two or three other languages. She's pretty simple mm -hmm. and she's entertaining in English, but I wouldn't adore her, but it's so satisfying when you can get it that that you're, you've are you got a lesser brain in that language and that lesser brain is happier with simpler things. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Oh, absolutely. I'm thinking of Isabella Allende and some of the works I've read in Spanish because English wasn't the same for me. It's just felt more fun to read in Spanish. So yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And and it's a brain teaser, which of course we can bring back to, you know, the whole keeping the brain sharp and keeping the brain going using words and, and using this concept. Or my one addiction is probably uh, doing solitaire on the computer. And I will jump from one type of uh, game to another. You have to think in different ways. Not as an exercise particularly, but because I enjoy it. When I'm tired, I can, my brain is kind of thinking. Sometimes when I'm trying to get a word in writing, I'll go play a game and while I'm playing the game, the word will pop in. But th there are all sorts of ways you have to think differently in solitaire. Hmm. I've never thought about that. I, I've not, I haven't, that's one game I haven't got into. I, I need to think about it because I do see a lot of people that really kind of say the same thing. You get to, you're challenging your brain in different ways and thinking differently. Right. There's an, I, what do you call it? You can go on your computer, the world of solitaire, it's free. And the individual who's put it together gives you all sorts of different ones to try. I like it. Hmm. I'm going to have to check it out. I'm going to have okay. to. Okay. Is that a promise? You're raising your right hand? Got it. I will check it out. I will check it out. And it'll be in the, the podcast notes too for everybody else to check it out as well at, at drjkrausnd.com, guys. We'll put it over there. So Marjorie, let's tell folks a little bit about how they can find your book and and where they can get a hold of it and you know how... I really want to express that it's not just for kids, right? I want folks to understand. Not. So I'm going to let, let you take over there so folks can talk about where to find your book and, and things of that nature. I I feel like a salesman, which is the last <laughs> thing I want to be. But my publisher said, who's a friend? Uh, <laughs> he said, show the book. <laughs> there it is. Look at that. It's in a series. I have several more books, well, three more written than I'm going on. I'm, uh, he had me divide what it was a long book into two. So this is half of the first volume I did. And then he said, would I please show? Oh, here we are. That's the press, his press. And how do we say it's that? Right? Had, it's in the Midwest. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, I've done it. See, and I do feel... I still, I feel like not snake oil pushing, but I'm not one to push things. Oh, I hear you. I hear you. It's not easy. It's not easy. But definitely folks are going to be interested because let's put it this way. I, I can't tell you how many um, of my patients have talked about, you know, the different series, right? Especially the whole, you know, whether it's Lord of the Rings, whether it's, you know, all of the, the series that were meant to be for you know, children, but adults as well. And, and, and I like it because twofold one, we're getting people away from playing games on, on their phones all day long or texting We're we're actually expanding the mind a little bit, but also working on yes, words, playing with words in our heads, but also creativity in the mind and, and opening our minds up to new possibilities, which is what I love about your book and how the dogs are coming to life as you're reading. And it just seems that, you know, as we get older, one of the, the things of coming to life again, maybe reinventing ourselves again is is coming back to who we are as a person and really embracing the childlike desires in, inside of us. Very good. Entirely agree. 
appreciate you giving us the insight and and letting us know about how all these things kind of have have manifested for you because I think for a lot of us we do wonder what it's like you know to lose a husband what it's like to to lose friends you know what it's like as you get older and and this is a great insight it's yeah. hard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah but it's the as it is and maybe as it should be there you are mm -hmm. it's beautiful that way you know real it's it's life marjorie thank you so much for, for chatting with me today and giving us all of these insights. I look forward to sharing your book with everyone. And and guys, The New Cadets, it's going to be, it's published by Gabriel Head Press. We'll have that at <laughs> drjkrausnd.com. We are not going to forget about that. Um, <laughs> we want everybody <laughs> to know that. Oh my goodness. Thanks again, Marjorie. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Janine.